right, great. Uh, well, thank you all for coming to my talk today called uh, AI Lab Recipes. We'll be uh, cooking up AI applications on our laptops. Uh, my name is Michael Clifford. I'm a data scientist at Red Hat. I work in the office of the CTO, uh, specifically in the emerging, techs, emerging tech uh, team, which is responsible for you know, evaluating technology that's uh, maybe two or three, well, six, six months to a year at this point uh, uh, down the road that can be maybe useful for, for integration to Red Hat's products. Uh, and even more specifically, I've been working on the AI team, which has been keeping us quite busy for the last uh, year or so. Uh, yeah, so unless you've all been like living under a rock for the last year and a half, uh, it's pretty obvious to anyone that AI is here, right? And it's here in a very uh, major way. Uh, since the release of ChatGPT about two years ago, uh, we were all presented with this idea of like AI as a service. Uh, so no longer did you need to uh, like train your own model with your own specific data um, for your own very specific use case, right? To get some interesting utility out of AI. Uh, you could instead rely on like a pre-trained model, uh, some general purpose model uh, to do some interesting work. Uh, and that was really like really very cool. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, that, that was really cool, but um, people started to build out applications around that um, and around the, the OpenAI API, which again was, was totally great, but uh, it had a major problem, and that problem was you send absolutely everything to OpenAI or, or whatever the similar provider is, whether it's Anthropic or Google, you're, you're giving up all of your information, basically. And not only that, everything costs. Like, there's some per token cost to absolutely every, every interaction with them. Um, so it's not really the greatest solution for, for most people. Uh, and worst of all, right, it really truly is a black box. We talk about ML models being black boxes because you don't understand them, but this is like, you don't even have the access to not understand them. Like, they're, they're the blackest of black boxes. Uh, so it's not open in, in any way. And I think the open source community uh, and, and a number of organizations like Red Hat, IBM, Meta, um, have kind of saw this issue pretty clearly and um, wanted to do something about it and, and have made some, some pretty huge strides to bring AI into the open. Um, so just a quick barometer for openness of, of AI right now. Um, if we look at Hugging Face, which is like the de facto home for, for open source AI models uh, at the moment, uh, we can see that uh, this number is even a little bit older. It's like 130,000 open source models. Uh, and that's not models in general, that's just language models, things like Llama and GPT-2 and, and Mistral. Um, so that's, that's huge. I mean, that's a totally different world than we lived in even like last year. It, even a few months ago, it was like 80,000. So like the number of these things is, is exploding. Uh, but now we have a different problem, right? Uh, how do you parse through all of that stuff? How do you make a choice about which of these 130,000 models are useful? Or what do, you, what do you do with them? How, as like a developer, can I take advantage of all the cool stuff that's happening in open source AI? Uh, how, as an organization, can we like tap into the, the open source, uh, all the energy that's going on into uh, open source AI right now? So right, there, there's, there's a lot of great tools, um, and the list of tools is, is growing, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but I think a lot of the tools that kind of were first developed and are most mature are really geared towards that data scientist persona. Um, so like Hugging Face, for example, started by making it really easy to get and train and share models and data sets. But I'm not so sure that they really had like developers in mind when they started, people that wanted to actually use these, these tools, uh, these models to, to do something with their, their applications. Um, I'm sure they do now, obviously, but uh, yeah. So, so how do you get started building an AI-infused application? Uh, it's really quite a very big 
question mark for a lot of developers. You can obviously go to Hugging Face and download a model, but like, then what do you do? Um, so this is where our projects, it's kind of two closely interrelated projects, the AI Lab recipes and the uh, Podman AI Lab desktop extension come, in, come into play, both of which are fully open source, free projects. Um, so yeah, so this is something that we had started at, at Red Hat a few months ago, maybe eight, eight, eight or nine months ago, when we got a request to our team to run an LLM locally via Podman on a Mac, which at the time was a bit of a strange and tall order for, for Red Hatters. Um, but the point was that we wanted to kind of meet the developers where they are, and Mac is a platform where a lot of developers work. So the inception of this project was really to try to bring AI, make AI accessible to, to developers. We've obviously now like expanded to all the major platforms, but again, just to, to highlight that this is really about um, developer productivity and not so much about data scientists. Uh, so yeah, so now with about like two clicks, right, you can go from absolutely nothing uh, to running a containerized AI application, uh, like a chatbot or an image detection uh, tool uh, locally on your, on your laptop. Uh, you might ask yourself, you know, aren't these things super expensive to run and very computationally intensive? Uh, why would I want to do this on my local machine? Can I even do it on my local machine? Uh, the answer is yes, you can, uh, with some caveats. And why would you want to do it? Um, because really it gives you like the speed, freedom, and security as a developer to start hacking right away. When I say speed, I don't mean computational speed, but like organizational speed. You don't need to wait to like request access to uh, expensive hardware. Uh, you don't need to wait to get approval to use some external service or anything. You can just kind of get going immediately. Um, in addition to that, like I said, there's been many strides made in the open source community recently towards quantization, which has made like local inference um, much more practical and possible. Um, and furthermore, in this case, we're talking primarily about inference, not about model training, which again is a much lighter workload. So um, making a practical use case for developers who just want to start engaging with, with AI models, specifically LLMs in their applications, um, is, is feasible and reasonable. Uh, yeah, so as of May uh, of this year, we have officially released this Podman AI Lab desktop extension. I encourage you all to, if you have your laptops out now, go to Podman Desktop IO and download the uh, application, the Podman Desktop, as well as the, the AI Lab extension, so you can check it out. Um, <clears throat> and the goal of this thing really is to kind of serve as a go-to hub for developers that are looking to get started with AI applications that are built with Podman and are targeting Kubernetes as their ultimate deployment location. Um, so yeah, so this extension is great. And like I said, I encourage you all to, to go check it out. Um, however, for the rest of this talk, I'm not gonna talk that much more about the Podman extension, uh, but instead I'm gonna talk more specifically about the parts that I, that I worked on, um, which was the, which is this kind of like community um, that's been building out the content and the examples that are made available by the extension. So with the, the extension kind of like uh, publishes the recipes, but the recipes themselves are built uh, through a, a different process. Um, yeah, and, and what these recipes are, right? They, they, they ideally serve as like highly functional application uh, templates that are ultimately consumed by the, the AI lab desktop extension. So, so what are these things? Well, like I said, they're, they're the AI lab recipes. And what is what does that mean, right? What are the AI lab recipes? Um, well, like I said, in short, it's, it's an open source project. Um, this is a picture of the GitHub repo, uh, just to show you that it is a real, a real thing. And we have a, a good and growing uh, community of contributors at the moment. Um, so yeah, so the purpose of this AI lab uh, 
recipes community is, like I said, to exist like a little bit ahead of the desktop application and be a place where we can be more experimental and prototype with different types of like AI um, applications uh, and, and ideally get them included downstream into the, the AI lab extension so they can be served to, to people to, to use. Uh, and yeah, if you want to go to containers, AI lab recipes now as well, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, yeah, so what recipes do we currently have available for people to use? There's uh, the basic chatbots, uh, summarizer, code assistant, also everyone's favorite rag application to chat with your docs. But as we all know, like LLMs are only part of the story here. So there's also object recognition, speech to text, maybe it's an LLM as well, uh, image analysis. But I think most important to this list here is TBD. Um, these are kind of first of kind templates that we put together to get people started to kind of seed the idea of what we wanted to do here. Um, but there's a lot more that can be done for the types of AI applications that, that people want to, want to build. So again, for those interested, I, I encourage you to, uh, to join the community and add more, more recipes. Uh, yeah, so what are, like, what is the kind of design principle or the design philosophy that we wanted to bring to these recipes? So first and foremost, right, they are highly functional AI application templates, which is to mean like they're not intended to be used as is. I guess you certainly could, but that's not why we built them. They're intended to be like a really useful starting point so that you can have your container, you like the containers, the kind of the architecture, everything is there and then you're free to customize it to your specific business needs. Um, then model as a microservice, really like everything as a microservice. I think there's a lot of discussion about what are these models, how do we treat them, how do we fit them into our existing architecture, and model as a microservice is kind of a refrain that I like to keep keep telling people. Uh, but this is also, again, to like meet the devs where they are um, and, and make things as simple as possible. Uh, thirdly, local first, cloud a, a close second. And the point is here, like this is all about local development, so it's a non-negotiable for for the local, uh, the local uh, application to work. But obviously, you don't deploy things from your laptop on your laptop. Uh, we know that these things are intended to be put out into into production eventually, so we don't want to make any decisions to like make it work locally at the cost of making it uh, production ready. Um, that would be silly. Uh, fourthly, this is, like I said, for developers. This is not for data scientists, right? So we really have no concern whatsoever for, for the data scientists. We really think that this is important because, you know, data science is important. <laughs> There's a lot of questions around model training, uh, data management, model management, and all those things, you know, when you're talking about an AI application, a lot of those times those things slip in. Um, and it kind of confuses the matter. And we really want to remove ourselves from any, we're just assuming that the models provided to us are working correctly. Um, and then finally, there's, there's a notion of extensibility, right? We want all these recipes to be like modular and customizable and extensible, particularly because things are changing so fast right now. I mean, the different model server options are, are changing frequently. The different applications you want to use are different, you, you know, RAG, is here last six months ago, now graph rag. You wanna make sure that the, the thing that you're deploying is actually um, like flexible enough to be, to be changed. Uh, cool, so what is a recipe, right? Um, now I'm gonna walk you through kind of like the template for a recipe, or like the recipe of a recipe. Uh, but at the core of all of them, we just really have this, this simple picture, right? We have a model server that is exposing a, an API and an, AI, uh, an API and an AI interface, uh, just like a client basically that's interacting with it. And it's really like, a, a, try to be as simple as that. What makes one recipe different from another is like the specific implementation of these three components, right? So is this like a Langchain and Streamlit based chatbot using Llama CPP as its model server with an open AI compatible API? 
or is this a Gradio-based object detection application using Hugging Face and Fast API to build a, a custom model server? So I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but like as far as the AI lab recipes are concerned, these things are like fundamentally the same thing. And why do we do it like this? Um, well, basically pretty much because this is how everything else works for the most part. Uh, we basically just want to treat the model like a microservice and, and again, to, to meet the developer uh, where they are. And because it makes things really easy and it fits into the existing developer paradigm that, that we talked about making this you know, really, really accessible to developers. Uh, and furthermore, it'll make it even easier to when it's eventually moved to, to the cloud. Uh, so yeah, so part of my mission at, at Red Hat or just professionally really is to, to try to make AI easy. And I, I don't know what could be easier than just like adding another service to your application. Uh, cool, so now let's step through a little bit more details to, to complete this recipe. Uh, so what makes ours special? Um, well, uh, both the model server and the AI interface are built on UBI images, which are universal uh, base images that are built uh, and maintained by, by Red Hat, although fully open source. Uh, we also aim to support as many hardware accelerators as possible. Um, the accelerators could just as easily be on the AI interface side, but typically the actual computation that needs it is on the model server side, so that's why that's there. Um, but obviously, depending on the hardware that you're working with, this will dictate uh, how the container image is actually built. So if you're using NVIDIA um, or uh, another solution, uh, another, another hardware, that's, there's going to be different uh, needs for that. And we want to make sure that we're able to support uh, as many as, as possible. Uh, but yeah, so you might then be asking yourself, well, where are the models actually in this picture? Because I don't, I don't see any. Um, well, again, we want this whole thing to be as modular as possible. So like it is one option to, to bake the model into the, the image directly. Uh, but that kind of creates these pretty uh, like brittle, massive uh, images that you probably don't want to be moving around too much. So instead of that, we manage them like separately through a, a volume mount onto the container at runtime. And this is nice too because you can actually in many cases just change the model while it's running without any issue, um, which is can be nice in, in some instances. Uh, yeah, so cool. So now we kind of have this uh, this picture here, and this is really what the, the core of every recipe looks like. We have a model volume mounted onto our UBI hardware accelerated model server, exposing an API to a UBI based application to, to consume this model. Uh, cool, but what about this issue of extensibility uh, that we talked about? Uh, well, so from here you could do a number of different things, right? So what if we wanted to make this, we want to take our existing application and somebody says, well, rag, we got to have rag. We got to be able to rag our, our whole thing. Um, how would we update this thing? Well, um, we do it like this for the most part. Uh, and I think the most important thing to note about this, this picture is that like the core architecture isn't, isn't changing at all. Um, we're just adding something. So, you know, when this becomes, we got to do a rag database, you know, or sorry, a, a graph rag, we could easily make this a rag a graph or maybe in addition to this. Um, so again, we're just adding some things that the, I think the details on there are correct, but I'm not gonna uh, get into them. And then finally, it completely and totally goes without saying, but this whole thing is fully uh, containerized so that we can uh, run them where, wherever we, we need to. Uh, cool, so yeah, so that's kind of the, I guess, overview of AI lab recipes, what we have, what they are, why we're doing it. So now uh, let me give you a demo of, uh, of them so you can see them in action. Uh, so yeah, so the first thing we want to check out here is the Podman desktop. Uh, again, I encourage you all to 
install this as soon as possible. Uh, once you're on Podman Desktop, you're able to check out the, the available extensions. And we have the Podman AI Lab extension here ready to go. It just installs easily. And then you are provided with this cool little icon here to, to check it out. And yeah, it's, it's an app that has a number of, of options for us. The first thing to check out is, is the playground. So the idea here is, well, actually, let me start at the top. There's the model section. And in the models, we have a catalog of models. And like I said earlier, 130,000 models on Hugging Face. Like, how do you know which ones to use? Uh, so we've curated a list of, of models that we think are pretty good to, to start with, that are useful. Um, also, with concern to like licensing. So we make sure that all the models on here licenses make sense, which is typically a Apache 2 or, or MIT license. Um, if you're not happy with this list or you've created your own model, it's easy enough to go ahead and import a custom model for, for use. Uh, and then once you have a set of models here, you can actually start to do something with them. So say I wanna, I wanna chat with my model to make sure that it does what I expect it to do. I can create this thing called a playground, which in reality is uh, spinning up a container uh, that's actually serving the model. So you can go here. It's very small. Uh. Great, it works. <laughs> uh, great, so now we have a model and uh, we're able to play with the parameters and do what we want there. So that's great. So that playground exists. It deployed a service. Again, this model service is volume mounted the model where we can then interact with it. Um, so that's just the model management side of things. Let me talk now about the recipes and shut these things down. So I talked earlier about the list of recipes that, that we have available. These are how they get presented in the AI Lab extension. Um, uh, it's here, chatbot, some explanation of what this thing actually does. Uh, and then we can go ahead and deploy it. So let's just pick a different model here for fun. Mistral and start the chatbot recipe. So now what it's doing is actually going to the GitHub repository, AI Lab recipes, if it's not already downloaded, pulling the code um, that we, that's up there, building the container images. Um, on, this is pretty fast because everything was already, we found that I already had pre-built versions of all this going, but would go ahead and pull those container files, pull the code, build the images for us, and then uh, deploy them. So that's what it's done, and we can, here, and we have our chatbot application uh, ready to go. Great, so it's working. So again, this is pretty basic, it's pretty straightforward, but the idea is not to use this thing in your production application. It's just like you now have a containerized, you have the art, you have like the most, the foundation of what you need to do to take this to uh, like your use case is, is pretty much there. It just becomes like an issue of like UI, I guess, at this point. Um, cool, and the other thing too, yeah, so you want to customize this thing for yourself. Um, we're also, it, actually, I'm not gonna open it this way because it does something weird on my machine, but if you click this open VS Code button, it will, open VS Code and bring you to the code that is actually constitutes the entire application. So you can come here and, and customize it to your, your heart's content. Contains the, the container file, um, the chatbot UI, so it's like the actual system code. And uh, yeah, the one thing I think that's important for contributors is AI Lab YAML. Uh, this thing might really be what the recipe is if you're taking like a very literal sense of, of recipe, uh, because this 
uh, is the connection between the AI lab recipes and the AI lab uh, extension. It basically dictates what files and what code, what container files are built and how that constitutes the application. So this is literally like the instructions for the recipe, which kind of this is a recipe. Um, yeah, so the, the, that's how these uh, things are able to be interacted with from the, the Podman desktop extension, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and then if somebody is actually wanting to work on one of these things, develop them, I can show a little bit more in detail what the development side looks like. Not a huge, huge thing, but um, so, thank you. Uh, so this is my development environment here, working on the AI lab recipes. And as you can see, we talked about extensibility. So there's you know, uh, features that are not yet included, hopefully soon to be around like evaluation. That's something we wanna be able to have evaluation mod mod modules as part of the, the recipes. Um, the one thing that is there is the model servers, right? So our base one is Llama CPP, but we know that Llama is really popular. So maybe people wanna use Llama, maybe the new one will come out. So we'll, we have the option to make the model server like a swappable um, parameter as well. Um, Vector databases, again, like I said, right now we support Chroma, DB, and Milvis, um, but obviously like PG Vector is a popular one. There's other ones that we could be adding here. Um, and then, like I said, in a few weeks, I'm sure there will be a uh, graph DB uh, thing here as well. But most importantly, we have the, the recipes and obviously the natural language processing is the most popular one currently. Um, but this is just to like point out, LLMs are like super popular right now, but they're not the only AI in town. And a lot of people that want to do this work don't necessarily want to use an LLM. And we want to make sure that we're not missing that probably massive uh, group of, of developers. Um, but yeah, so again, similar to what you saw uh, previously when you just cut it out through the, the app, we have our our, our container file dictates how to build our, our RAG application that I'm gonna show you here. Uh, we have our actual like Langchain uh, code that we're gonna use. Um, and essentially this is an application that takes three container images, the model server that is like used for all of them, the, and then we add on the Chroma database where we're gonna store our, our vectors and then we have our AI application that's actually going to interact with both of these things to allow us to chat with our, our documents. So I'll just show you that here. Um, so we'll just run this image. Oops. So now we have our model server running. Uh, run our, our Chroma DB server. And then we'll run our, our application. And the thing to note here, right, is we're pointing it to the model endpoint that we want to use. So there is like a possible world in which there's a different model endpoint that you want to use. And you want to be able to swap this out very quickly. It's just like a parameter that can be changed. It doesn't have to, it's not like nothing's strictly bound. Um, we also are connecting it to the vector database this way. So again, you could swap that out just as easily. And then we volume mount to make sure that we have access to, to the models that we need. So now that we have these three uh, pods or containers working in, in concert, we're able to look at our uh, application here. Great, so now we have our RAG demo. Um, that's up and running. I'll ask it, uh, what are they talking about? So this should come back confused because there's no document, so it doesn't have any, just talking about the prompts, basically. It doesn't know what it to say. So now we can go ahead and add a PDF file about a fake meeting that I generated with three 
uh, three executives are talking about an AI business venture. So now that's been loaded into memory. We can ask what our, oops. This will take a little bit longer um, and it has nothing to do with the, it's the retrieval over the rag. It's just, it just got a bunch more text. So it's computing an answer over like a context length that's much longer than this, the question. So it takes a little bit more time. Um, and they're engaged in a discussion about ex exciting new AI business venture. So cool, so great. We've proven that we have a, a, a RAG application working. Uh, cool, so yeah, so that's, that's basically the demo I wanted to share with all of you. Um, and again, all those kind of things that I showed on the command line are is what as a, uh, when the, the recipe is like finalized, uh, it all gets encoded into just the one click that you do, so you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, but I thought it worth sharing for those interested in getting under the hood a little bit more. Um, and then the last thing to note here is in a near update, I'm not sure if it's in yet or not, um, but there was a little slowness there. That was all run all on, on CPU, so it was slow, but it was fast enough for iterative development, which is great. Um, but we're actually getting uh, GPU support for Mac. Um, uh, through this button here, uh, you can enable um, experimental GPU support using lib libk run um, as your virtualization engine that gives you temporary or like partial access to the, the metal on, on, the, on the Mac, which is uh, pretty cool. I don't think, I'm not sure if that's possible with other, other tools. Um, so that will obviously speed things up as well. Um, cool, yeah, and with that, I think I'm done with my presentation. Uh, last final thing, pitch, go check out Podman AI Lab. Uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions? So now that you've developed your application on your desktop, what is the next step? What, what, how could you, is there a straightforward way to, to run it as you have here, similar on a remote server perhaps on a Linux box? Uh, yeah, so I mean the the Podman desktop or Podman in general is quite good. <laughs> at, uh, do you mean like on a Kubernetes or what do you mean on a Linux box or even a VM, whatever you know, whatever works best? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's no reason to not. I mean, as long as it can be, as long as it can run pods and containers, it's no issue. Yeah. Is there some sort of way of having it, you know, show? give you some guidance as to how you would write your, you know, your manifest files or anything like that if you were to run it on Kubernetes? Excellent. Nice. I didn't realize that about Podman. Yes. Yeah, there's everything. I could have given that talk like without internet access. Yeah. Yep. I will say that so full like transparency. They're not like when it says Mistral, it's not the main. It's a GGUF file, so it's a quantized version of it running with Llama CPP. Um, so it's 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 not the true model, but it's good enough for development use cases. Hi, Michael. Hi, Sally. If I had an idea for an AI-powered application, would uh, I be able to add that application to AI Lab recipes and possibly get my 
application added to the AI lab extension? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was part of, hopefully, that was part of the talk was trying to uh, encourage people to uh, let them know that, you know, making their own recipe is fully possible and part of what we're trying to do with this AI, AI lab recipes uh, community. Like, the chatbot is fine, but there's all kinds of cool things that people can do, um, and we're kind of a small team right now, so having more people, more ideas is, is there. Um, if you go to the repository, you'll see there's hopefully good documentation for what constitutes a, a recipe. Like I said, we had the, the application code, the container file, all that stuff is fairly structured the way we want to, to have it. Um, and yeah, yeah, and we can do it. Last questions before uh, okay, it's the last one. Uh, if I understand correctly, I think the recipe consists of a model server and then a AI AI interface. So and every and the only thing exposed is the web UI interface. So if I don't like the web UI interface and I want to make my own, uh, can I get access to the API of the model server? Or is that not an intended use of the recipe? No, yeah, totally, of course. I mean, yeah, use a different UX. There's many different uh, options there. Fully change it. There's there's no reason to do that. You could to not do that. Uh, like I said, like the um, when we did the uh, when I showed you the playground, that pretty much just deployed a model server, and then the AI interface was the 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 um, the extension UI. But I could have pointed my uh, other uh, Streamlit UI at the same model service. You could have even had a third, you could have multiple UIs talking to the same model service if you wanted. There's, there's no reason to uh, limit them in any way. Okay, thank you, Michael, for a wonderful AI.